The Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. is proud to present Freedoms, Rights, and Responsibilities, a series of programs supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities' We the People initiative, dedicated to exploring significant themes and events in U.S. history and sharing the lessons with all Americans. like to welcome Councilmember Vincent Orange, the person who led the movement to return this celebration to the people of the District of Columbia. Councilmember Orange will be followed by our wonderful mayor, Mayor Anthony A. Williams, who will present the Emancipation Day proclamation to Councilmember Orange. Thank you. Councilmember Orange. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing this afternoon? All right, how's everybody doing this afternoon? All right, well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today is a great day in the nation's capital, and I'm here today to really just talk about the occasion as to why we are all gathered here today on April 17th. Now, in, on April 16th, in 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the D.C. Emancipation Act which freed 3,100 D.C. slaves. Now, this Emancipation Act was signed nine months prior to the Emancipation Proclamation that was signed on January 1, 1863, which freed the rest of the slaves in the United States. But the D.C. Emancipation Act is a very unique document. It is the only time in the history of the nation's capital or in the history of the United States where the federal government actually paid $1 million for the freedom of those 3,100 slaves. In other words, the federal government paid the slave owners $1 million to let those D.C. slaves go. And this was during a time when the AME Church, Bishop Daniel Payne was involved, our beloved Frederick Douglass was involved, and we also have a descendant of, of uh, Brother Chase, and we have his great-great-grandson here with us today, Alfred Austin, and I believe your uh, great-grandfather uh, ran the Bee. And the Bee was one of the newspapers that really spread the word. From 1866 to 1901, this was the biggest parade in the United States of America. It was a parade that was received by every sitting president of the United States. It was a grand time. It was a time where all our schools were involved, and you actually had to wear a certain dress. And it was just a grand time from 1866 to 1901. And then it all disappeared. But then there was a little lady here in Washington, D.C., by the name of Loretta Carter Haynes, who picked up the mantle in, the, in 1990. And she worked and worked and worked, and she labored. And Dr. Height, she would go down to Lincoln Park just by herself. She'd have her wreath, and she'd lay it at the Emancipation uh, uh, Statue. And then she went on and convinced the United States Park Service to actually release the document for the world to see, the Emancipation Proclamation. And then somewhere down the line in about 2000, someone called my office and asked me, would I introduce a resolution for Juneteenth? 
and that is June 19, 1865, when the rest of the slaves throughout the United States got word of the Emancipation Proclamation that was signed on 1863. What we went to do, we went to go ahead and write this uh, resolution, but then we found that there was this little piece of history that indicated that D.C. was first. The slaves was, were freed in D.C. first, and the nation followed. And we did more research, and we came across Loretta Carter Haynes. And I went to her uh, apartment, the Woodner Apartments, 16th Street, and Ward 4. This lady has dedicated most of her life to the D.C. Emancipation Act. Her home is a museum. She had the names of all 3,100 slaves. She could tell you how much they were paid for. Some were paid $100. Some, were, were, some slave owners were paid $50. And as time went on, we decided that we would introduce legislation to create a private legal holiday. Because, you know, you got to crawl before you can walk. You couldn't come up with the public holiday first. So we came up with the private holiday. And it was passed unanimously. And our mayor, Mayor Anthony A. Williams, signed the document in the year of 2000. But that was just the beginning, because the goal was to have a public holiday. And so we had our parade after 100 years of non-existent of this parade. We brought the parade back. And then we hooked up with TNT Fireworks under the direction of James Peters. And we had brothers and sisters on Pennsylvania Avenue shooting fireworks. And as time went on and, the, and momentum built up, and one day, Mayor Anthony, even Mayor Anthony Williams indicated while he was here on Freedom Plaza, he says, you know what, Councilmember Orange, I think we're on to something here. And I think if we just keep on moving, we can make this bigger and better. And then last year, I introduced the legislation to make it a public holiday, where we would actually close the government down, close the schools, and have a real celebration in, uh, in honor of those 3,100 slaves. But in order to do that, like anything else, you need the funds. So once again, I have to go trucking up to Mayor Anthony A. Williams. Mr. Mayor, I need $1.1 million to do this. Because although you know, it's a holiday, you have, to have, you have to have holiday pay. And so we figured out that it would cost $1.1 million. And then I went back and said, Mr. Mayor, but we also need money in order to run the parade. <laughs> so it came up with $100,000. $100,000 last year, $100,000 this year. And to his credit, he put $400,000 in the budget for next year so we can make it even bigger and better. So let's give him a round of applause. And so here we are today celebrating the, our first and only public holiday in the nation's capital. It's one of its kind. It's unique. We're here today to celebrate the emancipation of those 3,100 slaves. Now, in closing, I would be remiss if I did not say a little bit about our Congresswoman on the Hill, Eleanor Holmes Norton. She's not with us here today, but she did want me to indicate that we're not entirely free because as we look at the Capitol down the street, we are still absent down there. We do not have two senators. We do not have a person in the House of Representatives that can vote. We are subject to taxation without representation. And we're going to have to change all that. So while we're here celebrating today the emancipation of those 3,100 slaves, we still have a long way to go. And we cannot be really satisfied until we have full representation in the United States Capitol. But we have to keep our eye on that United States Capitol and keep on fighting until victory is won. And victory will not be realized until we have full representation in the United States Congress. It's a shame that my kids and your kids that are DC residents and are DC citizens cannot dream the same dream as every other kid living in the United States of America. My kids cannot dream of being a United States Senator. If you're a DC resident, your kid cannot dream of being a United States Senator. But we're all Americans. And it's not right. And it's time for us to change our history and make sure that we have full representation in Congress. So I want to thank you all for coming out here today. I want to thank the mayor, thank the council, and in particular, Dr. Hype, Mother Williams, and everyone else for coming out and participating in today's observance 
of DC Emancipation Day, and we will talk about the men that are wearing the, the black and gold a little later. Uh, but just really want to thank you all. And I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my lovely wife, Gwendolyn Evans Orange, the First Lady of Ward 5. She's always here with me by my side, and my children are running around here having a great time somewhere. So thank you very much, and God bless you all. Mayor Williams will now present the Emancipation Day Proclamation to Council Member Orange. Mayor Williams. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Get this adjusted here. First of all, let me, uh, well, we're going to honor her uh, later, but I want to take this uh, special opportunity to first and foremost uh, acknowledge and recognize uh, Dorothy Hyde, who's uh, with us and was Grand uh, Marshal of the Parade. Let's get for a big hand and acknowledge her. We have the first uh, mother of the district. My mother, Virginia Hayes Williams, is here. I'd like you all to acknowledge her. Give her a big hand. Pat Elwood, our acting secretary. Thank you, Pat, for working so hard on this. Give her a big hand. Acknowledge the hard work that Pat and her staff have done. Lee and everyone, thank you. I want to acknowledge, uh, because they are such uh, role models for our community and they're involved in such uh, important civic responsibilities, including the uh, monument to Dr. King, I want to uh, everyone here to give a big hand to the leaders and members of Alpha Phi Alpha and give them a big hand, acknowledge them. Thank you all. <laughs> to uh, Councilman Vincent Orange and all the members of the council, Linda Kropp, uh, David Catania, Phil Mendelson, uh, Jim Graham, who were here, uh, Adrian Fenty, who had a role in the parade today. I want to thank all of them, and especially, uh, Vincent, I want to thank you and uh, Gwen, the First Lady of Ward 5, for the wonderful job you do out there in Ward 5. You really have aggressively and ably led your citizens out in Ward 5, bringing better services to Ward 5, economic development to Ward 5, improving the in infrastructure out there. And uh, Ward 5 is immeasurably better for it, Vince. And so let's give Vince a big round of applause for his overall leadership in the city at this time. Now, I, I like to think that, if, and I've grown to, uh, and, I, and I will readily admit that I was following Vince's lead, but I, I, will, I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I've been an enthusiastic leader, a follower, in following his lead on Emancipation Day. Why is that? Because, as you all know, I'm a student of history. I love history. And one of the real honors of being mayor of this great city is how deeply immersed the city is in history of civil rights, the history of the Civil War, the history of the struggle for freedom. And it really is interesting that if you go and you read a lot of the books about Abraham Lincoln, you know, a big argument about Abraham Lincoln, they have the revisionists and the, you know, the traditionalists and this and that. There's a lot of debate about Abraham Lincoln. And one of the debates about Abraham Lincoln was whether the Emancipation Proclamation really did anything, because the Emancipation Proclamation, the critics would say, didn't really free anybody in the north, it didn't free anybody in the border states, and it didn't free anybody in the southern states because the country was still at war. So what did it really do? What did he really intend? And we all know that he was waiting until the Battle of Antietam. He was waiting for the north to win a, win a battle before he issued the proclamation. But I would like to think that the proclamation for the district actually signaled Abraham Lincoln's true intention because the proclamation in the district Proceeding as it did, the General Emancipation Proclamation actually freed slaves in the United States of America. And as Vince said, they actually paid over a million dollars for it. So if there was any question as to what his general intent was, I think it was that freedom should, for purposes of emancipation, prevail throughout the United States. And that initial signal, that initial jolt, happened right here. It was a jolt that began a struggle it was a jolt that began a journey, but everyone realized the journey wasn't finished. The journey wasn't finished in the emancipation of the slaves. The journey wasn't finished in political franchise. We all know that the journey isn't finished for economic empowerment for our people. And we all know, as Vince has so ably and, and illustrably stated, the journey isn't finished when it comes to voting rights and full representation. So I would say to you as our mayor, at the last time I have an opportunity to speak to you, 
as mayor at this important day. I'll be here next year, but I'll probably be an hour late because I'll be looking for parking. But anyway, <laughs> my, unless one of you all want to drive me over here. But, uh, but in this important day, let's use this as a day of celebration, but let's also use this as a day of commemoration to commemorate those who have fought this struggle, many of whom have died for this struggle for all the things we've talked about. And let's use this as a moment of dedication to know that the fight is not yet won on the franchise and the vote for the District of Columbia, on economic empowerment for our people, on equality in this very city. It's a good fight. It's an important fight. As Frederick Douglass of our own District of Columbia once said, those who profess to love freedom and yet deprecate agitation are those who want crops without plowing. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So with all those things in mind, Vince, if you could come forward. I'm going to now, uh, as mayor of the District of Columbia, hereby proclaim April 17th, 2006, as D.C. Emancipation Day in our nation's capital. All right, now what we've all come for today is to present the District of Columbia's Lifetime Achievement Awards. And I have the honor of presenting this award to Dr. Dorothy Irene Height. And first I would like to read a ceremonial resolution in the Council of the District of Columbia. Now you know this council's had a lot of battles over the years, and it's hard to get these folks to agree on anything, but they do agree on the two resolutions that I will be reading today. That is 13 to 0. And this resolution is a ceremonial resolution 16 225 in the Council of the District of Columbia that was approved on April 4, 2006. It reads To recognize Dr. Dorothy Height for an outstanding career and accomplishments in the forefront of civil rights and human rights for all people in the nation and the District of Columbia. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height was born in Richmond, Virginia, and at an early age moved with her parents to Rankin, Pennsylvania, where she attended the public schools. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in four years from New York University. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height worked as a caseworker in New York City and in 1937 joined the National Council of Negro Women, whereas Dr. Dorothy Height was on the national staff for the Young Women's Christian Association from 1944 to 1977 and helped develop its leadership training, interracial and ecumenical education programs, whereas Dr. Dorothy Height was the 10th national president of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height in 1958 became president of the National Council of Negro Women founded by Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height in 1995 oversaw purchase of the historic headquarters building for the National Council of Negro Women. The Dorothy I. Height Leadership Institute and the National Centers for African American Women on Pennsylvania Avenue in the nation's capital. Now folks, that, re that really deserves a round of applause. She is the first, not only the first female, but she's the first African American to own property outright on Pennsylvania Avenue. And in the parade today, we actually came by her building. 
and they have paid their mortgage, they own the facility. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height has been active in most of the nation's major civil and human rights events that included work with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, and A. Philip Randolph. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height, on April 17, 2006, will receive the District of Columbia's Government Emancipation Day Lifetime Achievement Award. This is what we're going through now. And whereas Dr. Dorothy Height, on April 17, will receive the key to the city of Washington, D.C. From Mayor, Mayor, from Mayor Anthony A. Williams. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height is the recipient of numerous other awards and honors, and in 1989 received the Citizens Medal Award for Distinguished Service from President Ronald Reagan, and in 1993, Spengarn Medal from the NAACP. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height, in October 1993, was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height provided leadership to expand the international work of the National Council of Negro Women to include Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. Whereas Dr. Dorothy Height in 1986 launched the annual Black Family Reunion Celebration, still celebrated each year and attracts millions of participants to the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Resolved by the Council of the District of Columbia that this resolution may be cited as the Dr. Dorothy Height Recognition Resolution of 2006. The Council of the District of Columbia recognizes and honors Dr. Dorothy Height as one of the nation's premier civil rights and human rights leaders and for outstanding contributions to the cause of fairness and justice for all people in the nation and the District of Columbia. And now if someone can hand me the Life Achievement Award. I'm honored to have this opportunity to present the D.C. Emancipation Day, 2006, April 16, 1862, the Lifetime Achievement Award. It reads, Dr. Dorothy I. Height, President Emeritus, National Council of Negro Women, District of Columbia Emancipation Day, Lifetime Achievement Award. In recognition of your distinguished career as President of the National Council of Negro Women, President of Delta Sigma Theta, Sorority Incorporated, and stellar leadership in the civil rights movement, you are accorded the District of Columbia 2006 Emancipation Day Lifetime Achievement Award. Let's all stand and give her a resounding applause, Dr. Dorothy Irene Hyde. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dorothy Irene Height. Thank you. Mayor Williams, and our council chair in the crop, and Councilman Orange, and to all of my friends, I, I don't know what to say about receiving the key to the city and having that privilege because it's a great temptation to receive the key to the city before the stores close. <laughs> but I will tell you that I have enjoyed this day because I've never seen so many people in such good spirit on a rainy day. And I think we should give everybody here a hand because it was really, was really thrilling because I think all of us appreciate a time when we come together and look at ourselves and who we are and the great people we are. I always say that I never call Washington my second home. I was born in Richmond, Virginia. I grew up in Rankin, Pennsylvania. But as a teenager, I went to college in New York so I'm always going to be a Harlemite. Wherever I am, I belong to Harlem.
because that's where I went when I was 16. But I really have to say, since those days when I met Mary McLeod Bethune, that was November the 7th, 1937, I had to escort Mrs. Roosevelt into a meeting Mrs. Bethune was holding, and it turned out to be the National Council of Negro Women. And as I was leaving, she said, what is your name? And I told her, she said, well, come back, we need you. And I have been back every week since 1937. And it has meant a lot to me. Made a difference, made a real difference in my life, the impact that I that, that had at that time. But the wonderful thing about it was that in 1939, I came to Washington, D.C. as the executive of the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA. And so, in a sense, I have lived in Washington as much as I have lived in Harlem because I was back and forth all the time commuting. And one of the things when people ask me, what, what is it that I'm proud of? I never fail to say one of the greatest achievements I think in my life was to put the statue of Mary McLeod Bethune in Lincoln Park. That to me was a great achievement. It took, four, it took 14 years it took four sessions of the Congress and two presidents for us to achieve it. But we achieved it. And we placed Mary McLeod Bethune. At that time, she was the first African American honored on public land in the nation's capital. And the first woman of any race to be honored on public land. And here we I am tonight, or today, enjoying being here with our friends in Alpha Phi Alpha who are helping us all see how we need to put the first male on public land in African American male, Martin Luther King Jr. And I think that's something that we have to do. Because what we have learned, and I think today tells us, Councilman Orange, that if we do not honor ourselves, no one else is going to do it for us. And we have to speak up for who we are and what we want. And I have been blessed to live and now to be a full-fledged resident and property owner, Mr. Mayor, as you know, in the city of Washington. And I feel very proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that we are speaking up about who we are and about slavery. And to be able to sit here and look there and see the nation's capital and remember that Mary McLeod Bethune always said, I want to see my people have a strong presence in the nation's capital. And to be looking down there and seeing at 7th in Pennsylvania, there is the capital. And behind us is the White House. To be between the White House and the United States Capitol is a pretty strong presence, and we're glad to be there. And I have to tell, I have to tell you and thank many of you, because it is fully paid for, 100%. But you know, the great thing that I did not know until we had bought the, we were buying the property, was that that is the site of the largest uprising during slavery. 77 people who had been enslaved tried to escape. They did it on Bastille Day when the French were celebrating. And in that celebration, one of the sen senators went to the floor and said, we are shouting and celebrating liberty with France. And here we are celebrating and mobbing for slavery in our country. And that occasion 
where those slaves were, were not able to get away into the Underground Railroad. They were brought back in chains. There are two little girls with them, 15 and 13, the Edmondson sisters. And those children and all were brought back. Many of them were sold right there at the Central Slave Market that you can see the National Archives stands on that spot now. They were sold right there at 7th and Pennsylvania Avenue. And it was that whole experience that led Harriet Beecher Stowe to write Uncle Tom's Cabin to expose the, the, the horrors of slavery. But it also did another thing. It got the message out, even to others who were enslaved elsewhere and was a great move for, against slavery. And that's why I say our ancestors already had bought the, the building, the land. What we have done now is to reclaim the building and we're gonna see to it that it never leaves the hands of African Americans. So that for me today is a very special day because it not only reminds me of my history, but it gives me the courage and the inspiration to say that we all have to work on and work harder. Mayor McLeod Bethune once said, the freedom gates are half a jar. We're the ones who have to, to pry them fully open. And whenever I see and feel this spirit that we have in the District of Columbia now, and when I can stand here and say thank you to the mayor and to the leadership for bringing about this program, I want to say not only thank you, but in the short period that I have to live, I want to do all I can to see that those gates are freely open and we have freedom for everybody of every race and every creed, every color, that we have not only law and order, but we have equality and justice. Thank you very much. Give a big hand, everybody. You're fantastic. And Mother Hyde, I know you have so many awards, I don't know where you put them all. Uh, but as someone who is a beloved uh, follower of yours and has the deepest uh, respect and admiration for what you've done over your career, for all of us in this city, for all of us as African Americans, for all of us as Americans, because your fight is the fight of all of us. As mayor of this city, I want to present to you uh, something I've been very stingy in presenting to people. I mean, you've got to be a president or you've got to be a Dorothy Height to get a key, of, from, key, of, key to the city from me. I don't give it to everybody. But uh, the stores are still open. Please take this key and enjoy it. <laughs> and you'll notice, Mother Height, that this is, the, this is a modern key. It's designed for the next century because I believe that while you represent so much of what is glorious in our past, and we don't know really where we are unless we know from whence we come, I think you're a forward-looking person. Even though you're only 29 years old, you're a forward-looking person. Okay. And, and you believe that this fight has got to continue, and I think that this key, stressing as it does, a look toward the future, I think belongs especially to you. So on behalf of everyone in our city, Mother Hyde, I want to present you with this key to our city. You don't have to give another speech, but we love her. Give her another big hand, everybody. The 4th, 2006. It reads, to recognize Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated for achievements and contributions of scholarship and service to the nation and the District of Columbia. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated was founded in 1906 at Cornell University Ithaca, New York, whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated was the first intercollegiate Greek letter fraternity, fraternity established for African American students and the first unit organized as Alpha Chapter for college men of African descent. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated 
founders were Cornell University students Henry Arthur Callis, Charles Henry Chapman, Eugene Kinkle Jones, George Biddle Kelly, Nathaniel Allison Murray, Robert Harold Ogle, and Vertner Woodson Tandy. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated has grown steadily to include 125,000 men and in 1945 became an interracial fraternity and has 350 college chapters and 350 alumni chapters in 44 states, the District of Columbia, the Caribbean, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated on April 17, 2006, will receive the District of Columbia Government Emancipation Day Lifetime Achievement Award for 100 years of service to mankind. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated includes members such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Thurgood Marshall, W.E.B. Du Bois, John Hope Franklin, General Roscoe Cartwright, Louis Sullivan, Dennis Archer, Willie Brown, Mark Marial, John H. Johnson, Duke Ellington, Donnie Hathaway, Rosie Greer, Jesse Owens, Edward Brooke, Eddie Robinson, and Lenny Wilkins, to name a few. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated has inspiring national programs such as go to high school, go to college. A voteless people is a hopeless people. Whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated men wear the colors of black and old gold. And whereas Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated has its motto, manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind. Resolved by the Council of the District of Columbia that this resolution may be cited as the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Recognition Resolution of 2006. The Council of the District of Columbia recognizes and honors Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated as one of the nation's outstanding intercollegiate fraternities and for the time, service, scholarship, and talent contributed by its membership to the nation and the District of Columbia. If I can have the Lifetime Achievement Award. And before I read this, I would first like to uh, call up our former General President, uh, Henry Ponder, if you could please stand. Our Eastern Regional Vice President, Dennis Kemp. Our Executive Director, Willis Willard Hall. And I'd like to have come to the forefront the 32nd General President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Daryl R. Matthews, Sr. Would you please come forward? <laughs> Mr. President, I'd like to present to you the DC Emancipation Day, 2006, April 16, 1862, Lifetime Achievement Award. It reads, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the first intercollegiate African American Greek Letter Fraternity, the District of Columbia Emancipation Day Lifetime Achievement Award. In recognition of 100 years of service, manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind, in your national programs of go to high school, go to college, and a hopeless people is a voteless people. We salute you and celebrate with you your centennial anniversary being held in the District of Columbia. Ladies and gentlemen, Daryl R. Matthews. Mr. Mayor, Dr. Elwood, Councilman Orange, and to the distinguished and eminent Dr. Dorothy Height. It gives me great pleasure today to receive on behalf of the men of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity this Lifetime Achievement Award. I want you to look, if you are in the audience today, look around you at the men of Alpha Phi Alpha. You could find some other men, but you couldn't find any better men than the men of Alpha Phi Alpha. Now, let me tell you, in a day when Hollywood glamorizes our image and tells us that a song like It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp can win an Academy Award, the men of Alpha Phi Alpha intend to make it hard out here for a pimp. Amen. We intend to show up 
in the neighborhoods. We intend to be role models for young men. We intend to mentor them and to show them there is another way. You see, because the negative role models are there every day. They report for duty. They're there full time. So I am so proud to have the singular honor of being the general president and receiving this award. And if you'll indulge me for just a moment, you know it has been written that you can free a people, you can change their condition, but until you change their consciousness, they will still continue to make enslaving choices. Moses freed the slaves, but as soon as he turned his back, they began to worship craven idols. You know, some of us have traded Master Pharaoh for Master Card. It is still slavery, any way you look at it. So I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, and I would be remiss if I did not say, we need your money and we need your help to finish the monument, the memorial for Dr. Martin Luther King. It is the people's memorial for Dr. King. It is not just the Alpha's memorial. Dr. King's contributions to the world were larger than just any one organization that he belonged to. So we thank you for your support and your assistance. And Mr. Mayor, we plan to break ground November this year. So we thank you. We thank you for your support. And to the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha, keep doing what you're doing. You don't make the news because you're not full of bling bling. But we know that we're the backbone of our communities. We need God-fearing, strong black men to build strong families. And I'm proud to be associated with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our interim secretary, Dr. Elwood. Would you please stand? Let's give her a round of applause for all the hard work she's done and her staff. We also like to thank Estelle Mathis Lloyd and my staff and government operations staff and everyone else that worked on this project to make this uh, a reality. Once again, we want to thank Mayor Anthony A. Williams for all the work that he's done in supporting this effort. And at this time, you know, we, this could not have been done without the assistance of the chairman of the city council. She supported, she supported our efforts all the way through. Uh, I brought it to her and she supported it. And without her leadership, we would not be here today as well. So at this time, uh, she couldn't be here earlier because she had another speaking engagement, but this is so important to her, DC Emancipation Day, that she did make it back. And she is a Delta, and so I know she wanted to see her uh, Delta sister be honored here today, and she was able to make it back for all that history. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the council, Linda Kropp. Ms. Kropp. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Orange, to our distinguished mayor, Anthony Williams, to Mr. Orange for all of his hard work in bringing this forward. To the honorees, my sorority said, Dr. Dorothy Hyde, and to the men of AFIA, congratulations to each and every one of you and to the distinguished platform guests. Happy Emancipation Day! Happy Emancipation Day! You know, as we left the parade route and we started out from 4th Street with the Capitol behind our back, but we marched forward up and facing the White House, but in between there is the Wilson Building, and we stand now on Freedom Plaza. And how symbolic for us to remember Emancipation Day where freedom came to people in Washington, D.C. And as we stand here now, we still have 500,000 plus people who are still not free in Washington, D.C. But it is symbolic for this parade, for this day, for this thought, for our deeds to send the message clearly and strongly that we shall not stop until it is true Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia, where residents here will have voting rights. So as the rain stopped and the clouds moved on and the sun is shining down on each and every one of you, and as we look at the trees with the leaves starting to blossom and give a sign of rebirth. 
May this Emancipation Day be the rebirth of a new District of Columbia where we shall also have voting rights and voting representation. Happy Emancipation Day. Once again, thank you everybody for supporting this event, for celebrating this wonderful occasion. I would now like to introduce Dr. Morse, who himself presided over one of the ceremonies this week at the 15th Street Bat Presbyterian Church, who will now give the benediction, after which Dr. Betha Minas from UDC will lead us in the singing of the Black National Anthem. Dr. Morse. God is good, and all the time. You know, scientists tell us that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, our road to national wholeness uh, didn't take a straight line. It has had crooked and twisted roads, uh, deep valleys, ex uh, high inclining hills. It has been rough and it has been rugged. It has had its share of lurches and detours. Yet we stand here on this bright, glorious day in celebration, and we need to give God the glory. And I think that as we celebrate, we also need to be reminded uh, that the race is not given to the swift, but to those who endure to the end. And I want to challenge you to walk together, children. Don't you get weary. But there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. And in order to do that, I challenge you also to be such people and to live such lives that if each person would be like you and live a life like yours, then this indeed would be God's paradise. God bless you. To the end. And I want to challenge you to walk together, children. Don't you get weary. But there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. And in order to do that, I challenge you also to be such people and to live such lives that if each person would be like you and live a life like yours, then this indeed would be God's paradise. God bless you. Good afternoon. To God be the glory for this day, Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia. I invite you now to stand and join with me as we sing our national black anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. 
We. Oui. 